Thank you guys so much for joining us uh, today on the app or on the computer, depending on what you're using. Uh, we're thankful that you're taking advantage of this resource and, uh, and just hope that it's been a blessing to you. And if our church is continuing to feed you spiritually and being a blessing to you and your family, we would encourage you to continue to give. Uh, in particular, right now we're in the phase of getting ready to build out and extend our student ministry building. So you're already in the app or on the computer. All you have to do is go to Give, and you can set up the giving either one time or reoccurring. And again, we're just so thankful. So I hope that you enjoy the message. Have a blessed day. Happy Father's Day to everybody out there. Y'all give it up for the dads in here this morning. Come on now. Out of all of the nine months leading up to the coming of your child, we know that you work the hardest. And we know that for those three to 12 to 24 to 48 hours, you struggled the most as that baby was coming. It was your hand that she broke during the epidural. It was you who dealt with all the emotions leading up and thereafter. You were strong. You were man. Hear me roar, right? In the society we live in today, <laughs> it's all about hearing the ladies roar, right? We want ladies to become men. Not really, ever, at all. Um, just heads up, we don't. Um, but, guys, you are needed. You are important. You are absolutely essential to the equation. And when you don't act out on the role that God has given you man a family suffers but praise the Lord for godly men in the house of the Lord today and this morning uh, we pray that we as a church will be essentially just guided towards equipping and raising up where families can continue to thrive continue to grow and to be healthy spiritually more so even than physically because that's what we're seeking to do this morning in your worship God if you'd grab it just for a moment we got a few things pastor Mark hit on most of those small groups have begun but that means nothing if you have not joined a group. I said this uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whenever the last time I did um, a message, I think. Uh, if you are an attender, you should go to a group. It is essential if you are a Christian. If you are a member, that's what we do. Remember that part of it. That's what we do. We make time for community. We make time for accountability. We make time for relationships so that we can grow into the men and women of God that he intends us to be. If you've never gone through growth track, today is the day following this service. We're not doing the training thereafter because it is Father's Day, but we are showing you what it is that being on the dream team is all about, the responsibility, the privilege, and the honor it is to be able to serve people and know you're making a difference every single week. So I'd encourage you to go to that next door into the student ministry building. If y'all would, turn with me in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 1. Jeremiah 32, verse 1. I don't know that this is really a Father's Day message. Um, I just know it's in the Word of God, and therefore it's good, and it's profitable, and I'm not used to carrying a mic in my hand, so I'm going to fidget around here just a little bit. Oh, I wanted to update you too, for all of y'all who are, who are a part of this whole journey that we're taking. As many of y'all know, and some of y'all are brand new, Maybe it's your first week to be here. Uh, we are working on, looking towards, praying towards uh, expanding the student ministry building, the building that you see right there, putting a facelift on it, uh, having a huge covering like a couple weeks ago when it was pouring rain. I know some of y'all moms out there would have loved to have driven your car underneath a large pavilion and been met by smiling people. You were met with the uh, parking team, but we would have people underneath there too. Uh, we're looking to build that, to do that. We have $234,000 thus far since only a few months ago going towards. So that's a huge blessing. We're, we're getting closer, yeah. So I just want one, thank you for being faithful to give. One, I want to encourage some of y'all who have never given before and you don't even understand the principles behind it. As a Christian, you're generous. As a Christian, you give. And again, if you believe in the ministry and what we're doing here, I encourage you, be a part of making a difference and knowing that you're impacting not only your kids' lives or your life, but also the families yet to come here. So in Jeremiah chapter 32, we're looking at something pretty amazing. The title of the message today is The Perplexing Ways of God. Do you ever find God to be hard to understand? None of y'all ever pray to God about things that do not occur. Yes, everybody finds God somewhat difficult to understand at times. Have you ever prayed for something that you were so dead set on that you knew it was surely the will of God that you knew it was the right thing but it did not happen or maybe it happened in a way completely 
different than what you had imagined in the first place. And every single one of us who've ever prayed can say, yes, you would have been married to a lot of different people if your prayers had always been answered, correct? You would have been in a different country. You would have been in a different state. Things would have been different for you. The thing is, there's a lot of aspects about God that are unsearchable and he reveals to us what he will but he's God and we are not and so therefore there's many things in this life that are perplexing parenting is perplexing um, I find myself at a loss uh, many times of wondering like what in the world were they thinking you know I, I came home yesterday and it was awesome but my son and my daughter both had uh, it was called slime is what they said it was it was from a birthday party and it melted all over their hands all over their face all over their legs and I was like you're not coming inside you don't belong in this house anymore you know what I'm saying like I I'm perplexed by this we've been working with Abram and when he gets older if you ever were to hear this message you'll be embarrassed by it. but we've been working with him about you know being a big boy and and going to bed at night without any diapers and that's been going good for a while but whatever happened he changed his mind and so for like the last three nights I'm like no dude like you keep peeing on yourself that ain't happening like you're gonna have to wear a diaper <laughs> like every number that's short he says it's three every number that's long he says it's 14 I said it's gonna be 14 days before you get to get out of those uh um, uh, diapers at nighttime and he was like no daddy but it's perplexing do you ever notice that people people are perplexing people are crazy man you know, that country song, what is it, like, beer is good and people are crazy and stuff like that? It's not too far. It's not too far off the, off the track. People are nuts. Not all of them, thankfully, but we all got a little crazy inside of us. Some of us just express it a little bit more often than others, right? Some of us like to express it on social media and like to tell everybody about our problems. Great place to do it. God, though, on the other hand, is beyond comprehension. It tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are my ways your ways declares the Lord for as high as the heaven as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts which leads us to Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 1 we're going to skip through some of these verses it's pretty long set but it says this the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the 10th year of Zedekiah the king of Judah which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon, which was Nebuchadnezzar, was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard. He was imprisoned. Uh, that was in the palace of the king of Judah, for uh, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had imprisoned him. So I want to give you a little bit of context right here. God had been warning Israel had been warning Judah for years and years and years by the prophets if you keep on sinning I am going to discipline you like I told you in the law of Moses if you keep on doing this I am going to send an army against you if you keep on disobeying me I am going to discipline you severely okay and the Lord doesn't just spank in the case of Israel he literally killed many of the people and deported most of the rest of them and so the context here is that Jeremiah is the Lord's man and he's in prison for speaking the word of the Lord because he, kept, he keeps telling Zedekiah, listen, you are going to go to Babylon. You are going to be captured. The city is going to be plundered and burned to the ground. Bad things are coming unless you repent of your ways and repent of your sins. And Zedekiah, because he feared the people, would not do it. So he threw him in prison now listen to what happens when he's in prison. Do you think as a person of God, like you're in your mind, you're like, God, I'm your man, I'm your woman. Like I'm doing the right thing. I'm being faithful. Does it ever kind of perplex you that bad things end up coming your way or people treat you bad or speak ill of you? I mean, does that ever happen to any of y'all? It should freak you out just a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, God, why is this happening? Or why did this take place? Or why are they saying these things about me or in my direction? Listen to what happens with Jeremiah when he's in prison. Jeremiah said in verse 6, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hananel, the son of Shalom, uh, your uncle, will come to you and say, By my field that is in Anathoth. For the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hananel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy the field that is in Ananoth, the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. 
And I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanam, Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money for him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, I sealed it, got witnesses and weighed the money on the scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms, conditions, and an open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Barak, the son of Neriah, uh, the son of Mahasiah, in the presence, that's a hard one, of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase and in the presence of the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Barak with this saying, Thus saith the Lord, the host, the God of Israel, take this deed, both this one that is sealed of purchase and the open deed, and put them in the earthenware vessel, that this may last for a long time. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Okay, Jeremiah's situation is not a good one, right? He's in prison. The city is surrounded. He's been prophesying for years now, almost 30 years he's been saying, the city is going to be destroyed. People are going to be killed. And if it's not by the sword, it's going to be by pestilence. If it's not by pestilence, it's going to be by starvation. It's going to get bad in here. He is in prison for speaking God's word. And here comes his cousin rolling up, saying, why don't you buy my piece of property right here in, in Judah? You know, why don't you buy my piece of property three miles away from Jerusalem where everything is being destroyed and pillaged? It's about to be under the hand of the most powerful ruler in the known world at the time, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, can you imagine somebody coming to you with that proposition? Wouldn't that just tick you off a little bit more? Like someone offering you a house that's worth $500,000 and they say, listen, I'll give it to you for $25,000. The only thing is it's in Afghanistan. That's not really a deal, is it? Man, you watch some of these shows. What is it, HGTV that has house hunters? I don't necessarily watch this show because I don't have that channel, but when you go to Quick Care, that's all they're ever playing. And so I get to catch up on it when I get sick every now and then. And so inside of that place, you find people who have a budget of $1.3 million and they collect crickets. Like, where did they get $1.3 million? They're 25 years old and they're in college. That makes no sense to me. Where, where did they get the money? Like, I need that type of job. It seems to be a little different. I don't know if it's embezzlement or selling drugs on the street. I don't know, but it seems like they're making a lot of it. But the whole point is, is that worse, he's in prison, and then here comes his cousin. What in the world could be in his cousin's mind that would send him there to say, buy my property? Because everything's going to hell and back. This will be a great idea. But yet Jeremiah, being instructed by the Lord, actually buys it. And so this is what happens to Jeremiah. He's being faithful to the Lord. He's being obedient to God, verse 16. And after this, um, after I had given the deed of purchase to Barak, the son of Nerea, I prayed to the Lord saying, Ah, Lord God, is it you? Is it you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm? Nothing is too hard for you. Do you ever find yourself just saying, ah, oh, Lord, back in the same position again. Two steps forward, three steps back. Here we go again. God, I thought I was being faithful to what you told me to do. I thought I was doing the right thing. And Jeremiah was doing the right thing. He had heard clearly from the word of the Lord, and yet he finds himself saying this, Ah, Lord God, like what have you gotten me to do? What have you gotten me into this time? What is happening to me? He goes on to say this, and he starts praying to the Lord. But in verse 25, he says this, Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy this field for money and get witnesses though the city is given into the hands of Chaldeans and here comes the word of the Lord to him verse 26 and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah behold I am the Lord the God of all flesh is anything too hard for me is anything too hard for me and I, I read that different the other day after you read a verse a bunch of times over you kind of start digging in a little bit deeper notice what Jeremiah says in verse 17 he says ah Lord God nothing is too hard for you and what does the Lord say back to him he says is anything too hard for me you know Jeremiah you said that I can do anything Jeremiah, you proclaimed great things about me. You believe great things about me. You have the right doctrine about me. But Jeremiah, do you really 
believe that I can do anything? Do you believe that I'm going to bring about what I've told you to do? Do you believe in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the people who are mocking you? Do you believe my word? And that's what we asked the church this morning. Do you believe the word of God? Can you trust him is what this is really getting at in spite of the circumstances, in spite of what people say about you, in spite of the opinions of those who mock you? Can you trust God? And I want to say this this morning. Yes, you can. Dads, yes, you can, who are working your tail off trying to make a living. Yes, you can trust him with your finances. Yes, you can trust him with your finances. Yes, you can trust him with your family. Yes, you can trust him with your child who you think is going off a cliff. Yes, you can trust him. Be faithful in spite of what you see because what faith is, the convictions of things not yet seen. It's a conviction like you believe in your heart in spite of the circumstances. I believe you, God, because what does God end up saying? Verse 36 with me. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city which you say it's given into the hand of the king of the Babylon by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, what's God saying here? He's got some good news. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger, in my wrath, and in indignation. I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell safely and they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing them good and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice. Listen to this church. I will rejoice in doing them good. I will rejoice in doing them good and faithfully bringing them back to their land with all of my heart and with all of my soul. Listen to what God's saying to you this morning. For the children of God out there, I rejoice to do you good in spite of your circumstances in spite of what you're going through in spite of what you think is on the horizon because you can see the storm clouds God has good intentions for your life it doesn't always feel that way can we get an amen y'all aren't awake can I get an amen it doesn't always feel that way have any of y'all lived long enough to understand sometimes it hurts well if the Christians would go ahead and come up here, just a few of them, and we'll leave the rest of y'all back there who have never experienced such things. Think about this for a moment. I'm going to go ahead and go in the points because we're getting out of whack. Faith is obedience to God put into action. Faith is obedience to God put into action. When the circumstances look like there was no way out Jeremiah was still faithful he didn't want to do it he didn't feel like doing it he knew that it was going to hurt to do it it was going to cost him to do it but yet he remained faithful to the Lord now you got to understand this too Jeremiah was not one of those TV evangelists who everybody cheered for and sent money to so that he could bless your little cloth. No, that was not Jeremiah. Jeremiah was hated by his family. Jeremiah was hated by his friends. Jeremiah was hated by the king and by the religious leaders. Jeremiah was not someone who was popular in the nation, and that's what got him thrown into prison. Why did he get thrown into prison? Because he was pushing political propaganda? No. Because he was being faithful to the word of the Lord. I just want to remind some of us as believers in Jesus. There are going to be many times that doing the right thing will hurt in this life. There's going to be times when you begin to put into place to turn the other cheek because you love your neighbor as yourself because you love and you pray for your enemies when you obey the word of God I want to say this to you got to ingrain this into your head or you are going to be perplexed about life as a Christian because you're going to be really confused most of the time because you think that it's all butterfly and roses and it's not it just simply isn't this is like a reality dose check I guess you would say God's intentions for you are good but you got to realize that he's working you into the person that he intends for you to be those things that you're going through are refining you as gold much greater than though and is preparing for you glory and honor and praise at the revelation of Jesus Christ amen God is preparing you and me for eternity but you got to have faith 
I, I got to say it again. You got to have faith. Because you're going to go through things in this life that are not easy. But God never left you. That's, that's, God never left you. God will, future tense, never leave you. He's not a God who changes with the shadows. He's not a God who changes because his emotions get out of whack. No, he's a God who remains the same. He never lies. He always keeps his promises. He always comes through because he's God. He has no other choice. That's who he is, amen? It's not something he forces himself to do. It says he rejoices to do you good, to do me good with all of his soul and with all of his heart, amen? He rejoices to do that. Faith, Hebrews 11, 1 is now. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please God. As Martin Luther said, faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace. So certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting it. Such confidence and knowledge of God's grace makes you happy joyful and bold in your relationship with God and all creatures have you experienced a little bit of that I'm not saying for those of you necessarily who are right brand new on the journey I'm saying for those of you who've been walking with the Lord for a while you've been keeping in step with the Lord according to Galatians 5 like you know what I'm talking about where it's like I don't understand how it's going to work out but time and time and time again he brought me through you see, the promise is that he will walk with us through the fire and he will be with us through the flooding and the raging rivers. The promise is not that you will not go through the fire for the fire cleanses you. It gets off the bad, purifies the good, prepares you for heavenly blessings. You got to understand that this life is preparation for the one to come. And this life is only a few years and the one to come is eternal. Amen. You are being prepared to be with Jesus for it says only the pure of heart will see God. And I want to say this to you. Those who don't have a pure heart don't want to see God. Don't care what our lips say. It's what our actions declare. God is purifying every single one of us in the fire of affliction, in trial, and he's bringing us into infinite relationship with him. You see, most of us, we don't necessarily want to walk by faith. We want to walk by what? Give me the GPS. Tell me every single step that is ahead of me. I don't want MapQuest. That's so 10 years ago. I want to know exactly what's coming up. I want to know if there's traffic. Show me the red, right? Show me the red. Doesn't that get you? Man, we miss so much traffic sometimes when you go on I-20. There's always a wreck. There's always somebody. And then they have construction. Here's what I don't get about. I'm perplexed about this too. I didn't mention this earlier. When you have construction and you have one lane, does that mean everyone needs to slow down to 15 miles an hour? Is there anything to look at? Stop rubbernecking, right? Like, what is it? I get more amens for something like that than I do the Word of God. I mean, seriously. That's what causes more wrecks. It's the people going 15 miles an hour. There's no need for that. There, that's what they call back roads. You can go back roads if you want to go 15 miles an hour and you like red lights. Interstates for going fast. Everybody's got to get to their throne at Bucky's, right? <laughs> we all want the rest of the story. And what God gives us is what? Gentle guidance along the way. You want and I want, let's be real, a spotlight. And God says, I'll give you a what? My word is a lamp. Not a lamp that you pull like that, that gives off a pretty good bit of light. The lamp that they're talking about is a little bitty, about the size of your fist, oil lamp. Just enough light to see you through. Why does God not give you the whole picture? Well, I bet, I bet there's a million reasons. One, you would be scared to death, and you wouldn't take another step. Fear paralyzes so many people. Fear paralyzes so many people. But I want to say this to you. God gives you just enough light so you're doing what? You're always and continuously, as much as you hate it, depending upon him more and more and more and more and learning to trust him. Amen. Learning to trust him. We don't naturally trust God. It is something that is learned it even says that Jesus himself, who was perfect in every way, learned obedience through suffering. You see, we all, 
I hope we want it, but nonetheless we say it. We all want to be like Jesus. But we hate the process. We all want to be like Jesus, but we hate the process. Being refined in the fire or being in the hands of the potter and we being the clay, it hurts. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and die daily. Think about that for a second. How many of y'all have given up friendships? How many of y'all have given up things and resources? How many of y'all have been possibly stabbed in the back, if you will, proverbially? Maybe literally. (laughs) How many of y'all have gone through rough times and you just don't understand it, but yet God is saying, I hold true to my promise. I am bringing you home. It's a journey. It's a process. I will see you through until the very end. Secondly is this. There will be many occasions of bewilderment as you follow Jesus. There will be many cases. The book of Job is a book of bewilderment. The book of Job is a book of questioning, why, God, is this happening to me? What have I done again and again and again? Job asked those questions, and yet it is not until the very end in chapter 42 when Job does what? When Job gets his answer? No. Until Job is in the presence of God himself. Listen to what it says in chapter 42, verse 5 and 6. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Listen, some of y'all, y'all are living on second-hand Jesus, okay? Y'all are only getting a message on a Sunday morning. You're only getting a little bit of Caleb in the mix of everything else. Listen, you need Jesus filled into your life. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that takes you doing what? Disciplining yourself to read in the Word of God, to surround yourself with other people who can lift you up. He said this, I heard about you with my ears. Now what is he going to say? But now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What is that another way of saying? It's not just physically with his eyes. What he is saying is, I am in the presence of God and all of the questions are overwhelmed by his presence. The bewilderment, the pain, the doubt, the misunderstandings, just all of those things begin to fade away when you're in the presence of God. When you're drawing near to the presence of God, his presence overshadows those very things. You see, Jeremiah was perplexed. He said, oh, Lord God, what have you gotten me into? What are you doing to me? You know how we combat and overcome the overwhelming feelings of bewilderment and perplexion? What did Paul say? I'm perplexed, but I'm not what? Destroyed. You know, I don't understand it all. Have you gotten to a place where you're okay with that? Have you gotten to a place where you're okay with that? David says in Psalms 139, he says, your ways, they're just too high for me. He says, I I don't even try to go beyond what you're willing to give me. God doesn't mind your questions by any stretch of the imagination. Just read Psalms, right? But I'm just asking, are you okay with not getting the answers? Are you okay when God is silent? Are you okay when when you're going through a season that you might call dry? When you just feel like you don't feel the presence of God like maybe you used to or maybe, are are you okay to still trust Him? Are you okay to still believe Him? Are you okay to still walk by faith? Because again, our natural instinct is what I gotta see it to believe it and God says that's not how I work. Are you okay to keep on going and to keep on moving and to keep on believing and to keep on praising and to keep on praying and to keep on pressing and to keep on reading? Are you okay to do it? Because that's what it takes. You want to get out of that rut? You keep on pressing. You want to get out of that dry spell? You keep on pressing. 
You want to get out of that just overwhelming sense of loneliness? You keep on pressing and you keep on getting around people even when you don't feel like getting around people because you need to be around what people? I don't feel like going to church anymore. It doesn't matter. You keep on pressing and you keep on moving and you keep on going. You keep on doing the right thing. What did Jeremiah do? Did he give up? Did he quit? Just because he was bewildered? Just because he said, oh, Lord God. We got way too many quitters today. Way too many people who said it, it's supposed to be easier than this. What Bible are you reading? It's not that easy. But it is so so rewarding man the treasure's there baby oh man it is there the lord will draw near to those who draw near to him it's his promise his son died so that me and you could be what at peace with god in a loving relationship with him we call him abba father i mean that's the god we serve but that doesn't change that you will go through difficult situations. And lastly, as we get ready to close, God's plan for your life is to do you good. On Father's Day, you need to hear that. Because you're kind of like, well, that was kind of hard stuff. No, no, no. God's plan is to do you good. Can we agree with that this morning? God's plan is to do you good. God has compassion as a father has compassion upon his children. God grants the desires of all of those who fear him. God loves his people he loved you so much that he sent his own son who was perfect to die for you god proves his love every single day by giving you breath god proved his love on the cross god proves his love by bringing us to himself god proves his love every single day god's plan for your life is to do you good you can go through any trial and still be okay at the end of it when you understand that God's plan is to do you good. How does that work? It lets me know that in spite of what's happening to me, and by the way, don't give yourself no credit. We do some pretty ignorant things, right? <laughs> Where's my amens on that one? We do some pretty stupid things. And we're like, God, I really need you to bail me out this time. And the Lord's a good father. Some of y'all bail out your kids all the time and they don't need to be bailed out. They need to learn a lesson. God's a good father. He disciplines you so that what? You can, Hebrews 12, share in his holiness. And the fruit of that holiness is what? A life of righteousness. A life of righteousness. You can go through any trial if you know that God is for you and that God is with you. We know this from Romans 8, 28. That all things, they, they do work together for the good of those who love God and are called according. They, they do. Can we agree with that this morning? They do. Do they work together in your time frame? Not necessarily. Do they always work together in a way that you can visibly see it in this life? Not necessarily, but they will. They always work together because no one can stop the plan and the will of God. Nobody can thwart it. Man, that gives me promise for a better day. And if God is for us, doesn't matter really who's against us. Because is anything too hard for God? God can use my mess. God can use my mistakes. God can use all of the stupid stuff that I do and can use that to teach me a lesson, to discipline me, bring me out to the woodshed and bring me back a better person. God can do that in your life and God can do that in my life because God's intentions for my life are what? To do me good. To do his children good. We've got to hold on to that when you're going through trials and when you're going through tribulations because he says this to the people of Israel. He says, all of these bad things that are happening to you are because of what you have been doing, but I have good news for you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a single-mindedness towards me, and I'm going to do good for you because I love you. But it doesn't mean I won't discipline you in the process. One of the most confusing verses that we read or hear people talk about today, and we all love it because it's a great verse. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Right? 
Absolutely, 110%. But I want you to remember where that verse was laid. Chapter 29 of Jeremiah, the city was besieged. The people were starving to death. They were about to be slaughtered and the rest of them were going to be deported and only the poor people were going to be left in the city. The temple was going to be burned down. The houses were going to be burned down. The king's sons were going to be killed in front of his eyes as well as his leaders and his eyes were going to be poked out and brought to Babylon, okay? Listen, in the midst of this, in the midst of your trials, God is saying to you, there is promise, there is hope, but I want to tell you something, you are still going to go through difficulties. You're still going to go through trials. Psalms 119.68, you are good and you do good. Praise the Lord about that. We'll finish with these last little points there. So why, why does God bring us through so many difficult things? There's a bunch of reasons, but maybe there's just a few that can stand out for just a moment. God knows we need help in the arena of humility. How many of y'all need help being humble? Every single one of you. You know, we all need it. We live in a culture that tells us you need to be, you know, a lot more self esteem. I think we probably need a lot more repentance and a lot more elevating of God and esteem of God and exalting of God. God knows we are not in tune with reality, and therefore, He knows that we need a lesson in humility. Because the promise of humility is this what? God will what? Exalt the humble. God will exalt the humble. Secondly, God tests his children. All of the children that he loves, he disciplines. God tests his children. Job 23, verse 10, he says, But he knows the ways that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. We love glass, don't we? It's nice on your vehicle, nice on your house, you know, nice in a cup. But that gold was first what? Sand that had to be heated to what? 3,090 degrees. Fun fact, trivia, right? Coal, good for energy, but a lot better when it turns into a diamond. I just want you to think about it. It takes a lot of heat. A lot of pressure and a lot of time. God's got you through a process. He said, I will begin the work in you. I will also finish it. You have your part to do, right? We're to discipline ourselves. We're to grow in the word, grow in prayer, repent, be in fellowship together, so many other things. But he says, I'm going to start it, and I will finish it. Did you notice what he said there? In verse 39 through 41, he says it again and again and again. I will, and I will, and I will bring them back, and I will give them a single heart, and I will bless them, and I will show them favor, and I will bring them back into the land. What is he saying? It's all about God. I rejoice to do my people good. That is the God we serve, and that is the God we love. That is the God we seek to know more of, and that is the God we get to spend eternity with in new heavens and the new earth. And thirdly is this, God conforms his people into the image of his son. That's what you signed up for. Romans 8, 29 for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What do you say in verse 40? I will make with them an everlasting covenant. How do we experience that covenant? How do we experience the pleasure and the joy and the mercy of God fresh and new every day? How do you do that? His name is Jesus. Jesus is the answer to that covenant. Jesus is the answer to that prayer. Jesus is the one who was sent for you, who died for you, who came at just the right time in history, whether you believe that or not. 
to pay for my sins and for your sins. Not that we would just be forgiven. That's wonderful, right? But that we would have peace with God, that we would have a relationship with God, that we would be uniquely united with God, that we would have the righteousness of Jesus, that we would get to spend eternity with Jesus. We would be with the Father. We'll see Him face to face. We're going to be in a new heavens, in a new earth with resurrected bodies where there is no more pain, there is no more problems. Think about it for a minute. God promises to do what? I rejoice to do you good just let that sink in for a second I rejoice to do you good so whatever you're going through today whatever maybe you're living through whatever maybe your past holds that for one reason or another you still haven't given it to Jesus At the foot of the cross, shame falls. At the foot of the cross, humility must be born. Jesus paid it all. He gave it all for us. And He didn't leave us by ourselves. He sent the Holy Spirit to fill us, to empower us, to teach us, to comfort us, to have fellowship with. He's given you power to live in victory on a daily basis. He's given you power to live in victory in spite of physical ailments that might maintain to be with you for the rest of your time here on earth. It's much more important to have a healthy soul than a healthy body. Nobody wants to amen that and I want to get better too. I want to pray for miracles too. I believe in miracles too. I believe God can do all things. But at the end of the day, I know where my home is. At the end of the day, I know where I'm going. At the end of the day, I know who I'm serving. At the end of the day, I know who I'm trusting. And this is not even the beginning of the story. It's not until we go through and we see Jesus face to face that the story even begins. This is just the beginning. You have a God who loves you. And you have a God who says, I delight in doing you good. Be faithful to me throughout this life. You will not regret it one second for all of eternity. Let's stand together.